Hello and welcome to another Catholic Reflection video. Uh, today I'm going to be reviewing the interview I had with Ryan Mercer over at Catholic Truth. Uh, this uh, discussion took place about a week ago and about 51, 53 minutes or so of it uh, was posted on his channel. Uh, as of uh, Sunday or Monday a few days later um, I wanted to do this review of myself how I explain things uh, for two reasons uh, one is it gives me an opportunity to look back and to reflect and to expound upon things that I have said and also this is an unedited version so there's going to be an additional 10 to 20 minutes uh, worth of content um, of uh, me explaining things that were not included in the original video due to time restraints so with that uh, we're just going to go ahead and uh, let myself talk absolutely thanks for having me brian yeah, you said you were a big fan of John Wesley and you were a big fan of Wesleyism and I'm assuming you thought that was the right way to go. So I'm curious kind of how it all got started and how you got into it so deep and then what some of the problems were that you started seeing and how you ended up getting to the Catholic Church. Uh, what's interesting here is uh, we didn't have any discussion before about necessarily the kind of content that I would share uh, because I was on the Journeys Home program about, I don't know, maybe 15 years now. Uh, it was uh, 15 years ago. I shared my journey on EWTN's Journey Home, um, having a dialogue with Marcus Grodi, and I w focused more on the theological points uh, and didn't focus um, on myself uh, as a person as much. Uh, as such, um, I decided that um, that I would be more personal in this one. Uh, I would I would share some more of my experiences, and that's why I took this video the way that I did. Uh, as such, I did not do any preparation or anything like that. And in case people are interested, I do have uh, Brian's permission to share. Uh, his content of me uh, on on this channel. Sure. Well, I'll start at the beginning with my childhood um, and how I uh, got interested in John Wesley. Um, I grew up in a agnostic home, and so there wasn't a lot of talk about God or anything like that. And um, uh, so I was very nihilistic. Uh, I was very uh, skeptical. Uh, I, I remember just seven or eight years old, I began contemplating the permanent extinction of my consciousness, and uh, I used to cry myself to sleep because it would wow. fill me with so much dread. And um, so my, my intellect was awakening, and I began to really contemplate the kinds of things that I was uh, absorbing in my home, in my school, and in society. And uh, this is actually a, a key point. Um, we don't get to choose the country we live in, the time we live in, the parents we have, um, the schools that uh, we go to for the most part. And um, <clears throat> all of the messaging, all of the ideas that uh, we are confronted with uh, often may be good or bad or a mixture of both. Uh, as such, uh, we have a tendency to start with those conceptions, and if we do not have any challenges to them, uh, if we were not well read, uh, what se uh, seven or eight year old would be, then one basically just starts with the kind of spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, or more specifically, the uh, culture in which I found myself. So uh, we all grow up in homes with differing ideas, so we kind of grow up in a fishbowl. 
and uh, we need to critique and analyze, um, accept, throw out uh, ideas that are no longer uh, convincing. We don't find certain arguments to be valid or cogent. Uh, we acquire additional information by which we can uh, test out ideas and basically put it underneath a microscope for deeper evaluation. Uh, so this is something in which we find our all, all, all of ourselves uh, f uh, face uh, having to analyze these kinds of things. Um, just It was unfortunate for myself that as I was growing up, uh, there wasn't um, much philosophical reasoning beyond the bits and pieces of things that uh, I had picked up and uh, unfortunately had very ne had a very negative impact upon myself and uh, which uh, I definitely uh, uh, is a great example of uh, having good catechesis because um, I was basically absorbing all of this modern philosophy not really knowing um, what it was and uh, so for, for me it was the best ideas I had at the time and contemplating those things uh, without being able to challenge them I think what's what's important when it comes to like modern philosophy often the kinds of uh, systems of thought uh, that influence us has a lot to do with modern philosophers. So Immanuel Kant, David Hume, um, uh, psychological um, uh, uh, <clears throat> figures such as B.F. Skinner, uh, we have um, uh, the existentialism of Sartre, uh, uh, we have the socialism of Marx, we have a lot of different philosophical influences at any given point in history. Uh, what is pertinent for our own time is to be able to recognize um, the, the influence from these particular philosophies um, to because these are the ones that we're most likely going to be impacted by. Uh, Postmodernism, uh, the idea of um, uh, competing meta narratives, and, and so on and so forth. How we understand truth, um, how we understand correlations between things in the mind and outside of the mind. Um, you know, whether there is metaphysics, and uh, if so, what particular metaphysical ideas uh, are best. So, having been exposed to these kinds of things in our culture, we kind of have to deconstruct our thought life. We have to first learn what these philosophies are, find out how they influence us, and analyze whether or not these are really good ideas by doing a comparative analysis between them that had influenced us and those philosophies that are better that have not yet influenced us. So it's important that we uh, have that kind of metacognition, that kind of um, deep self-comprehensive analysis of that interplay between influences and what we have owned, those ideas through which we've been processing um, our self-understanding and reality with better reasoning uh, certainly was a problem for me. Um, so I shared that part of it because when I was about 17, 18 years old, um, I was at a very uh, low point in my life. Uh, my teen years were absolutely horrible, so not only did I absorb uh, nihilism, uh, but I suffered uh, the suicide of my father when I was 10 years old. So I, I, I went through this huge rebellious phase in my, in my teens. Um, 
I basically did whatever I wanted, said whatever I wanted, and basically just gave to myself whatever I wanted. You know, so I went through that phase of just exploring every inclination, um, entertaining any ideation, and uh, basically found that uh, all that did is uh, corrupt my soul and get me in trouble with the law. And so, but when I was about 18 years old... And I can't imagine you were actually happy either. No, I was not happy. Um, in fact, I would... Uh, I had a, a huge problem with authority. Uh, I basically just acted out to amuse myself because it was the only catharsis that I could find. And so... It's kind of like a drug. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because... It was almost like there wasn't anything that people or society could do to me that was already um, worse than what I was already feeling deep inside myself. And and so I, I just did not care because there was this just lack of objective meaning, you know, and just kind of drowning in this sea of meaninglessness. And, um, you know... Um, <clears throat> I saw the consequences of my own thinking when it came to purpose and meaning, and I had recognized that not only me, but other people sometimes fall into this trap of thinking that uh, we can create meaning for ourselves or that the meaning of our lives can just simply consist of... Um, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die uh, kind of uh, living. And that this is the extent to which we can have any kind of subjective meaning. Like, what does it mean to me? Um, All the while knowing objectively you are living in, in in a different universe that is objectively meaningless so whatever construct of meaning I could exist in my mind to uh, to cope or to soothe what my intellect otherwise could perceive that there wasn't any meaningless uh, that there wasn't any meaning uh, was a conflict because it's just a play in my mind it doesn't have a correlation to something outside of my mind uh, as such, I'm just deceiving myself with these intellectual constructs of supposed meaning and uh, hope that my mind doesn't get a glimpse of uh, anything outside or beyond that. So I definitely had a deep longing, but there really wasn't a, a solution to... From my perspective, there wasn't a solution to this experience. To th- this is my existence. This this is what it is until I die, and then there's nothing. Um, so there wasn't any objective purpose. But when I was about, I will um, uh, state here because some may get the impression that the only reason that I began to consider classical theism as a worldview is that I was motivated by fear and that deep down I still know everything's meaningless. Uh, This is just a more advanced, detailed, more sophisticated way of doing the exact same thing. I'm just creating uh, meaning in my mind uh, all the while knowing that deep down uh, I still don't know anything about reality and I don't um, have... uh, you know, any kind of way of uh, knowing uh, beyond naturalism, just being able to observe natural phenomenon without any kind of sufficient reason uh, as to why those things are the way that they are and just make an appeal to ignorance, all the while just kind of masking that worldview uh, with yet another uh, intellectual construct. Um, To the contrary, I I found the idea 
uh, of God to be very amusing at first. And so f for me, being able to explore those kinds of ideas uh, was uh, very important to, uh, to pursue truth, to at least be able to analyze it and rule it out as a potential uh, you know, competing worldview to what I had, had absorbed when I was a child. Um, but I remember when I was in high school, uh, a version of Pascal's Wager was shared with me, and it had to do with the idea of um, making a bet, so to speak. You know, if there is a God and we just completely ignore that, uh, ignore what I could be, uh, just continue down the path uh, of meaninglessness that I was going, um, that's not going to be very good for me. It'll be very disappointing to find out that uh, I could have had something better. Um, and uh, if I did pursue God and uh, I changed and um, I wanted to, you know, be with him when I die, uh, then that would be a great thing. But if there weren't a God and I just lived however I wanted anyways, I'd probably get much of the same as I had uh, just drowning in an empty way of life. Uh, because even all the pleasures we pursue are insatiable. You, you know, uh, we have to just keep going back to them over and over again. There's just something a bit uh, dissatisfying about that uh, over the long run. Instant gratification, sure, but um, nothing that's going to be uh, deeply satisfying and enduring. Um, but, it, you know, if God doesn't exist and I try to live a good life, you know, and I, I do pursue these ideas, you know, I mean, what do I really have to lose uh, by doing that? And I remember um, that argument drawing me to the point of, okay, sure, let's, uh, let's evaluate this. Let's take it under consideration. Why not? There's lots of ideas out there. I had not yet uh, considered this idea. So uh, let's give it a go. At 18 years old, I began to have a, a, a crisis. A friend of mine who was at that time attending the Church of the Nazarene, he had um, started inviting me to church. And so I started having this battle within myself. There are some new ideas. I'm contemplating this. Uh, I'm either not going to exist for all eternity or I'm going to go to hell. You know, it was just, um, I started to feel like I did when I was a kid. And just being filled with that, 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 that dread. And um, so the, I gave my life. Uh, th this this is in part uh, not just because like the fear of death but it's really the, the the fear of not knowing basically it's the fear of the unknown that uh, you know that I haven't died before I haven't experienced that uh, it's just one of those things where from what we observe it's kind of uh, a state of finality you know, I've lived my life. I was born um, and died. And so here I am. Uh, it's that sense of finality mixed with a, an unknown bundle of answers to questions. I'm not even sure if I can even answer or be reasonably certain. Uh, concerning to at least be able to know right so that's a more important point than just I'm afraid of something it's I'm not sure what it is that I'm afraid of the Christ during that time I, I was I was baptized um, changed a lot of things in my life were completely turned around at the time i was uh, uh living in an adult group home 
Uh, I was on SSI. I was told I could never really hold down a job, that I had mental illnesses. Um, I was on all kinds of different medications, I think seven at one time, uh, uh, treating various uh, psychological disorders. Um, I didn't have a car, I didn't have a job. Uh, everything was just very sad for me. Um, but when I gave my life to Christ, uh, you know, I don't recommend people do this. I did this in consultation with a doctor, but I took myself off all of the medications. I challenged the diagnoses because uh, I think that they were just trying to medicate me during, a, during my teen years to try to control my behavior. Um, and so I've been off medications now for 25 years and I'm actually quite fine. So it turned out to be quite good. But then I got a job, I got a car, I left the group home, I started uh, staying with my friend, I started going to the Nazarene Church on Wednesday nights, uh, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights. Uh, I got deeply involved, read through the Bible, and uh, it was my first real strong exposure to Christianity. Uh, I, I remember um, very early on, uh, the pastor had recommended that I read A. Horton Wiley's Introduction to Christian Doctrine. I remember there was another uh, book on Christian doctrine that, um, actually, sorry, it was uh, Introduction to Christian Theology by H. Horton Wiley. Uh, it was an, um, an introduction based on a three-volume set that expounded upon things more. And then... Uh, uh, there was another book in theology that went over the creed, and I just remember being just very fascinated with with these ideas. Um, so I just started devouring books on theology, um, books on. I remember reading the Case for Christ that uh, dove into. Uh, biblical criticism, uh, looking at the reliability of the New Testament, docu New Testament documents, and, and establishing the historicity of the person of Jesus Christ, and I, I just just started going from book to book, and it was uh, uh, a playground of an intellectual playground, exploring uh, uh, new equipment and swings and stuff. So. Um, so, uh, but for me, I, I've always been just like when I was seven or eight years old contemplating nihilism. Um, now I'm contemplating new things. And so I had to um, ground um, my journey uh, intellectually. Uh, I had to have firm reasons behind things. So I read books on the historicity of uh, the person of Jesus Christ, the reliability of the New Testament documents. Um, that's how I started. I had to ground it in something that was historical. Uh, and that's one of the great things about Christianity is that it's, it, it is grounded in history. God became man in history. And so uh, because the Church of Nazarene was a Wesleyan denomination, um, it started with uh, John Wesley was an Anglican priest. He began to create um, or sending people over to America, the Methodists. And so they eventually created the United Methodists. They, they, um, the other Wesleyan denominations sprung from that. But the Church of Nazarene came from, uh, came out of the Second Great Awakening. Um, the holiness movements, uh, revival meetings, uh, a strong enthusiasm um, for the grace of God, great optimism, uh, believing that there is this huge second conversion that occurs in the Christian life where one is entirely sanctified. It was one of the doctrines of John Wesley that... That's a big um, claim. Uh, it is, but it's highly qualified. Um, to, to, to them, it was the idea that when you become a Christian, there's, um, there's incompatibilities um, that exist, a strong inclination to sin. 
but they claimed that this bent towards sin can be bent back uh, so that the, 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 the strongest driving inclination is towards holiness. Now, I will add a qualification here, uh, particularly because, um, yes, the Church of Nazarene um, spoke more enthusiastically about this, had a greater optimism than, say, uh, John Wesley himself, uh, whom I go on to say, uh, I'll note here just because I wanted to make I want to make a point that uh, he taught that most people aren't entirely sanctified and those that are most of them uh, have occurs at the moment of death um, to put this into perspective from a Catholic perspective uh, particularly because from a Catholic perspective we, we speak of concupiscence it, it's a kind of um, disordering of our nature in, uh, in such a way that the intellect uh, d does not always properly govern the lower passions. Um, as a result, there's a continual uh, incongruity between uh, our, our intent and our uh, our actions uh, as it relates to pursuing what is the ultimate good for us, that there would be some deviations from this. Um, but Wesley had taught and the Church of Nazarene had taught that the heart becomes so flooded with the love of God that there is no room in the heart for sin. But it's also qualified that this has to do with a willful transgression against a known law of God. So it's very nuanced to what is having to do with culpability. Um, in Catholic theology, there is this idea of infused contemplation, a, a deep union uh, with God where one could at least, uh, uh, it's very possible uh, with the help of God's grace to be able to live a life of, of holiness um, so there is a kind of Catholic uh, correlation to all of these correlations, um, but uh, that's not usually how it's framed uh, in the Church of Nazarene. There's these altar calls, you, you give it, you believe it, and that's supposed to be it. But a lot of people do experience uh, occasions where they're just constantly having to keep coming back um, uh, to uh, once again seek entire sanctification. Uh, that's basically what the idea is. It's not uh, uh, a state of perfection. There isn't a restoration to the state of anime perfection, but there's this um, uh, bent in the heart uh, to love God. Uh, so there is a correlation, but there's also distinctions in the language and concepts that is used uh, to express it. Now, of course, uh, this is different um, than the, uh, the than what Catholic teaching is. Um, now, yes, there's the idea of uh, perfect love, um, the idea of not having any intentional sin. Uh, there might be some semi-intentional or, or what have you, but as uh, some of the saints talk about, but th there's always going to be uh, some incompatibilities that we at times uh, experience uh, within our soul. That concupiscence remains for the, to, uh, to train us in holiness and to test us and so on and so forth. So my experience was as I kept wanting to have what Wesley was claiming as entire sanctification, um, but um, that just wasn't the experience that I myself was, was having. Um, and he would highly qualify this with uh, most people. Um, don't experience this and those who do most of them experience it uh at the moment of their death you know so it it wasn't um 
as uh, prevalent in the thought of Wesley as it, as it became with the church in Nazarene, where they would just do this kind of second altar call. And the idea was is one would just completely and entirely devote themselves to God, fully consecrate themselves, and they would, uh, they would teach that if you did that, then you can w walk out of there believing that you have received entire sanctification. So there's a lot of presumption. Um, uh, people then end up having this, ex this, this um, uh, feeling like they have to keep consecrating themselves over and over and over again. Um, and so their experience isn't really fitting the doctrine very well. Uh, most people continue to struggle uh, with uh, sins, sometimes habitual or addictions or, or, or other things. Um, but that wasn't the, the main thing that uh, drew me. Now, it is true that uh, uh, one of the points of divergence is that John Wesley challenged um, Catholic m mystics. He believed that the idea that um, that God would withdraw his consolations from us to train us to better love the consoler more than the consolations themselves. Um, something that uh, Catholics are familiar with in reading the saints, dark night of the soul, so on and so forth. But Wesley proposed that this almost shipwrecked his faith. He, for whatever reason, believe, ended up believing that any time one experienced what one could call the dark night of the soul was because of sin. There was open sin in the person's life as opposed to um, God simply um, training us. So right. let's just ignore the lives of the saints and St. Teresa of Avila, who is in like perfect harmony with God. Correct. St. John of the Cross. Yeah, so he ended up uh, deciding not to uh, follow that particular train of thought, but the, the teaching of the Catholic saints better fit with my experience and uh, with what I had reasoned out. So uh, his challenge to that particular point thankfully didn't last very long in my own life because uh, I experienced the dark night of the soul a lot. Um, uh, my intellect has to hold me fast because, uh, because of my upbringing, my emotions sometimes just are all over the place. And so it's very difficult for me to feel that uh, God is near. This could have been because of my absentee father. It, 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 could have, it can be for many different reasons psychologically. And so if I conclude, well, this is always because of sin, well, I mean, I'm always beating myself up over that. You know, I don't feel God, it's my fault. It's always my fault. And um, that does something to uh, somebody's psyche. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it really breaks a person down. The contrast um, to that, I actually had, um, I was very, very charismatic for a while when I was in college. And I had very power to understand what I did, help me. And I, not to make them a God in themselves, but he's like, if I don't give you these things, what Catholic teaching is is uh, what I yeah I want to make sure it's my content and most powerful lessons that I've learned is that God's always there whether you feel him or not there you go that's, that's yeah the, uh, one thing yeah. that uh, helped me is uh, what I um, uh, this is actually something that was edited out so um, just to highlight that I learned more about um what Catholic teaching is concerning the nature of the human person as having an immaterial soul and that of the powers of the soul uh, is the intellect and, and will. And, um, and so I began to identify the spiritual journey 
uh, with an intellectual journey as opposed to as some may um, pit those against one another. Um, some go as far as fideism where they just simply believe something that might be contrary to what uh, reason could could tell them and and so for me um i had the tendency to trust my feelings a lot uh, you know and i think sometimes when people have an overly uh sensational brand of christianity uh, they're always looking for this hyped up psychological state or these good feelings, these fuzzies. Um, and this is what they're, they're, they're seeking after. Um, I, on the other hand, um, came to appreciate the fact that um, even in the midst of great difficulties, um, fear, dread, um, challenges and tests of all kinds, our intellect can still perceive that highest conception that is possible in the human mind, where our intellect can perceive God in the midst of all of that. And um, that has helped ground me through those periods of time where I'm emotionally overwhelmed, you know, because that's more of the uh, uh, sensitive soul kind of conception. But the, uh, it's, it's, our, it's our rational soul. It's our, our, our intellect's ability to be able to perceive the good, the true, and the beautiful, of which God is the, the culmination, the fullness, the perfections of these transcendentals. And our intellect can continue to look up and ascend and be able to grasp God in the most difficult situations. Uh, this is uh, this was a very fascinating insight that I had many years ago concerning the spiritual journey because the spiritual part of us, that is our soul, our soul is spirit, but not all spirits are souls, um, because our soul is spirit and that the predominant power of the soul is the intellect, the intellectual journey is uh, the spiritual journey. Uh, it is the, the, the way by which we perceive God, uh, by which we contemplate God, by which we see the good, the true, and the beautiful. Um, that uh, basically, uh, you know, draws our will as a rational appetite towards those things. And uh, that was uh, such a great insight that the, uh, because I had been told for many years that the spiritual journey was more about experience and feelings and emotion and so on and so forth and because I didn't have a lot of that uh, you know th that kind of uh, version of Christianity or that conception uh, makes me think oh, okay well I'm just kind of left out of all of that and um, but now I can continue to view those things as subjective. They may be there, but they might not. But I could still have a full spiritual life through the intellectual life because the intellect is the predominant um, power of the soul, and my, my soul is, is spirit. So that's the spiritual journey. Uh, that was such a huge insight that helped me uh, know that despite how I might feel, despite the experiences I'm having, I still have this intellectual journey. And uh, that uh, was a huge help to me. Uh, and it was a very healthy way of uh, looking at it and pulling me out of interpreting myself as uh, not having much of a spiritual life at all. Um, so going back to... Um, uh, uh, John Wesley. So there is a lot of people 
who go through life or like like with me growing up in my home simply absorbing the things around us we live in a fishbowl all right we're absorbing all kinds of influences and sometimes we are just by default thinking within those paradigms without ever challenging them you know kind of getting to a metacognition uh, where we're analyzing our thought, you know, that's basically what, what what logic is to help us do is to be able to analyze how well we are thinking. Likewise, the content with which we utilize, um, and unfortunately, and I don't blame people um, for thinking error at some point in their life. You know, to be very charitable towards people because I know that. When I was a kid, I was thinking with the best ideas I was exposed to at the time. Uh, when I became Protestant, I was thinking with the best ideas that I was exposed to at the time. And likewise, I just had to continue to challenge these notions. Um, and I, I did not realize just how much of modern philosophy I ended up absorbing and what I had to come to challenge within myself. So by learning more about Kantian epistemology, that distinction between the pneuma and the phenomena, that uh, lack of correlation between that thing that's in the mind and that thing that's outside of the mind, um, ended up leading me to, uh, even as a Christian, uh, into a kind of postmodernism that uh, uh, led me to the idea that um, our most basic assumptions uh, have to be simply assumed to save from an infinite regress of proofs. And uh, I, I remember uh, even uh, in my late 30s, uh, sorry, my, my early 30s, uh, that the more philosophy that I studied, the more I was able to identify those influences and how it was impacting my spiritual journey and so I remember just feeling like, and I, I just don't like this. Well, I just have to believe it. You know, uh, I'll stop there for just for a brief second. Um, these experiences I had uh, occurred uh, perhaps as late as five years ago, but even further, uh, 15 years ago. Excuse me. Um, I didn't realize the impact that modern philosophy had on me and how it was influencing my thinking. So when I became a student, when I became a student at Holy Apostles College and Seminary, I took about three courses there towards my master's um, 15 years ago. And I remember being exposed to Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas for the first time. And that has radically changed um, my thinking uh, about theology, about reality, how much reason can be applied uh, to uh, the Christian life. Uh, which correlates very heavily with uh, what the church teaches concerning that uh, and that most of the faith uh, can be explained by means of reason alone that the intellect is capable of not only understanding but discovering these things and that we can be reasonably certain that they are in fact true with the light of revelation, of course, uh, this becomes uh, much easier and we learn more uh, that we couldn't discover by reason alone, but those things that we can know from revelation uh, that uh, reason alone can explain is confirmed by revelation, Give, giving credence to those things that cannot be explained by reason alone, but those things that cannot be explained by reason alone can uh, and uh, are consistent with all the, the reasoning that we can do. Um, it uh, also isn't contrary to reason in and of itself. And also reason can be used to uh, understand and, and, and grasp 
those aspects of things that can only be known through revelation. Um, so there's a c congruence uh, that continues to exist uh, with human reasoning. Uh, but uh, until I got there, I continued to have the impression that at some basic level, deep down, I have to just keep making these blind assumptions just to bolster the entire system. Like the, uh, the further down in the foundation of a system of thought you go, the less certain uh, one is about said propositions. Uh, that whole idea just eroded the foundation right underneath me as a Christian and it began to chip away at my trust in God and so on and so forth. Um, it was a very pivotal moment, a pivotal moment in my life that, thanks to Aristotle and Aquinas, uh, helped to rejuvenate my faith, uh, deepen it, enrich it, and now I'm enjoying the fruits of uh, a solid foundation upon which uh, I can stand kind of attitude. You know, I, I remember this, uh, um, I was studying the Jehovah Witnesses in my, my early 20s, and um, I, I was actually working for a Jehovah Witness who liked to uh, talk to me all the time. And I was a new Christian, so um, I had to do a lot of study and research. But I remember I was sitting at the kitchen table, and I had the New World Translation, uh, I had the NIV, and I pushed them both in front of this guy, and I said, how do you know? And I remember him just saying, I just know. And it was intellectually dissatisfying to me because I could do that same thing with a Jehovah Witness, and they'll tell me, I just know. Uh, actually, to be fair, I, I think a, a Jehovah Witness may actually um, offer a reason or two, right? <laughs> which is which is saying something as to that's what my experience was here here they were being able to offer at least an idea or two as to why uh, but on the other hand this this christian man was telling me nothing at all um it was just blind adherence uh so yes very dissatisfying but because he wasn't offering me any reason and they were I had to engage that. I, I wanted to understand the issues. And uh, yes, the New World Translation is 99.9% is, uh, of uh, uh, Greek scholars who are cr uh, credible and are distinguished in their disciplines uh, think that th that is just the New World Translation is just not good. All right, to, to say it as charitably as I possibly can uh, so but it, it took me a long time to uh, to study some of those issues uh, particularly because especially with uh, uh, the Protestant doctrine of Sola Scriptura I myself have to do all of that heavy lifting Don't you know that I love you in a God of a Church, the, the authority in the church, which uh, was delegated uh, by Christ Himself, and this is insufficient. I mean, I'm glad that he w was a Christian, but the the, the lack of uh, an ability to um, ground one's position in something other than just a feeling, or this is how I grew up. Right. None of that was helpful to me. I had to dig into the Greek. I had to read commentaries on the Greek. I had to figure out exactly why different translations are the way that they are. And so, so for me, what eventually uh, helped me to um, critique the uh, Kantian epistemology and to get out of that kind of postmodern thinking was to um, begin studying Aristotle. Uh, so, uh, and for, for him, uh, what was uh, 
you know, the a philosophical revolution of his day is that he discovered the formal cause, the principle of immateriality. So he reasoned to the existence of an immaterial soul. He reasoned from physics to metaphysics, from things that he could observe in reason to the unmoved mover. This helped me better ground myself at, uh, in philosophy as opposed to just having that kind of skepticism towards can we really know anything at all, right? I'm about an infinite regress. Um, <laughs> so you're discovering all of these things. You're grounding yourself in epistemology and logic and, you know, you're a deep thinker. You know, how did that play with Wesleyism, you know, how did you end up rejecting that? Right. Yeah, we're, we're almost at the 25 minute mark. And I hadn't really talked about uh, John Wesley a whole lot, uh, which uh, I was wondering if after the interview that he thought, well, he didn't really talk about John Wesley a whole lot. You know, I, I didn't really have anything prepared that was specific. I, like I said, during my journeys home, I, I talked a lot about John Wesley, quoted his works, um, quoted him, the sermons, things like that. Uh, it was very detailed on my journeys home. You can see that on YouTube. Just do uh, journeys home, Corey Chambers. You'll see a uh, former Nazarene seminarian. Um, and so I wanted to do something a little different here, but because he continued to prompt with John Wesley, I'm like, I, I really need to get to uh, doing at least a little bit of comparative analysis between Wesley and the teachings of the Catholic Church. Uh, one quick story here uh, before I forget is that I remember I wrote this paper doing a comparative analysis on John Wesley and the Catholic Church. Um, during my senior year at Nazarene Bible College. And I remember that I stated in my paper that John Wesley hated the doctrines of Rome. And I remember the professor saying to me that that's very strong language. Uh, you might want to tone that down a little bit. And I said, well, I could just quote John Wesley, who said, I detest and abhor the doctrines of Rome. <laughs> Apparently, he had never heard that before. So, I mean, uh, I, 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 I just, I just thought that was funny because I just went the other way with it. And so, I've been building up to this. Uh, so, I began to question: Okay, what influenced Wesley? Because really, he's just a conglomeration of various influences upon his own thinking. And so I wanted to understand exactly how he got to where he was. And so uh, obviously Wesley is in the 1700s. Uh, he lived up into his 80s um, and he was an Anglican priest. So this is kind of like a post-Catholic church, right? In, in, in England, you know, as uh, uh, this is post-English Reformation, the, the post-English revolt from the church. And, um, but what makes, I think, Anglicanism a little unique over the uh, magisterial reformers um, is that they tried to, anyways, create a via media, a middle way, something that attempted to still hold on to um, some semblance of Catholic substance, uh, more so than, um, than, than Calvin or, or, or Luther. Um, so in Wesleyan scholarship, it's often said that John Wesley created a synthesis between Protestant principles and Catholic substance. So uh, Wesley actually critiqued Martin Luther for not understanding sanctification. Much of what Wesley taught about sanctification uh, came from Gregory of Nyssa and for, from, for, from Catholic thought, uh, whereby... 
Uh, who who was the other guy? Um, I wasn't like. Uh, it's not Marcy and the Egyptian. The Egyptian. The Egyptian. I'm trying to remember. Uh, the the name uh, I remember that was also so John Wesley had compiled writings from the early church fathers that focused on things like theosis and uh, de deification and so on and so forth um, and he would put them together in a kind of Christian library and he had read a lot of these these works because he wanted to in in his mind the real change that occurs in the christian that's real christianity right the inward witness the 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 uh, uh renovation of one's nature uh by the grace of god uh, to say it a catholic way that uh, uh grace perfects and elevates our nature um, and so his, the doctrine of sanctification was just very important in the writings of John Wesley uh, whereas he had critiqued Martin Luther for not thinking uh, correctly concerning the matter we actually become holy we're not just a dung hill covered by snow uh, it's not uh, merely a relative change in relation to God but a real change that occurs in the person so uh, Wesley had prided himself on uh, knowing in his theology the distinction between justification and sanctification and a full understanding of each now this was a point where I wanted to know how did he get to where he was it was the application of Luther's understanding of justification by faith alone that gave shape to his ideas. But when I started studying the, 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 the Council of Trent and better understanding that justification is that process by which we actually become just and that sanctification is an integral part of what justification is because for Wesley yes this is actually very important like 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 and I'm probably gonna say the same thing I'm actually going to just say but uh, I wanted to say that um, for, for John Wesley uh, God doesn't impute his grace where he doesn't also impart it right uh, there isn't anybody whom God declares to be holy who isn't actually holy uh, and, and these are actually, this is the Catholic substance, right? Uh, this is the real change uh, that, that that Trent talks about. Um, it's not so much that it's justification by faith alone. Faith is obviously the foundation um, and the fountain of justification, no doubt. And, um, and faith, of course, is never really alone is it when it's a true and living faith of course um uh, has more to do with the mere declaration a, a mere uh, juridical uh declaration where god declares something to be that is contrary to the nature of the thing itself and wesley basically said that this is weird you know we don't confound our righteousness with that of Christ any more than we would with Moses or anybody else. Uh, likewise, you know, God sees the real nature of things. There is no, um, and so therefore there, there, there is no dunghill covered with snow. Um, there isn't like a pair of Jesus eyeglasses where he sees us, you know. And uh, I certainly would, would, would like to take uh, a little bit of time to see what John Wesley thought concerning penal substitution. I, I think I remember he rejected it. I, 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 don't, I don't recall. Um, I, I, think that's not the, I, I think that's not the case. Um, but I, I could be wrong. I could be misremembering. Uh, but it's important 
from a uh, Catholic position to recognize that uh, it would be unjust for God to punish Jesus, an innocent man, instead of us who are guilty. Um, likewise, it would be strangely unjust for God to treat me as if I am Christ when I am not. God sees the true nature of things and always acts justly. Um, God's not deceived. He's not mocked. Um, there isn't a kind of legal fiction, uh, but rather there's going to be an actual real change that takes place. Uh, there's going to be a formal cause uh, for a justification by which we are actually made righteous. Any real change that occurs within the person was sanctification. Justification was merely juridical. Uh, it was merely a relative change that had more to do what God did for us. Uh, and Saint the Here, just a second. I, I think I misspoke. Really juridical. Because for Wesley, any real change that occurs within the person was sanctification. Right. All right. That's true. Justification was merely juridical. There it is. Uh, justification. Uh, it was merely a relative change that had more to do what God did for us. Uh, and sanctification was a real change. Uh, what God does in us. And it, it was a real change within us. Um, so realizing that... And, and, and so because he got that from Luther, then I had to challenge Luther. I had to figure out how exactly Luther began to depart with his conception of justification. And, and uh, this actually goes back to the new perspective of Paul. Uh, great scholarship that uh, demonstrates, I think, quite well that uh, a lot of Paul's understanding of Romans, uh, what, what, what Paul's point is in Romans and Galatians, was to fight against the Judaizers in the first century. It had less to do with Luther's angst against what he considered to be abuses or corruptions in Catholic theology in his own day in the 16th century. And so scholars have seen that he's been, he read that into uh, Paul's letters as opposed to understanding them correctly. So this was a huge uh, divergent point for me to, to um, move closer to the Catholic Church. Um, not only that, but um, Wesleyans speak of what is called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Uh, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And I, I remember uh, as a student at Nazarene Bible College, I was thoroughly ignorant about tradition, and if an early church father was mentioned, it was only in as much as it sounded Protestant or um, it, it wasn't even necessary to appeal to the fathers of the church. Uh, we did have one class on uh, Christian history. Uh, we didn't have like a history of Christian thought. Um, it focused very heavily on scripture and the theology of the Church of the Nazarene. So it was thoroughly Wesleyan, uh, focusing on the doctrine of holiness and, and everything else. But now, th there were enough similarities between the two. Uh, Wesleyan was an Arminian, and that has some, um, that uh, James Arminius was actually influenced uh, by Louise de Molina. So um, there was some compatibility there, just like how um, Calvinists who become Catholic, uh, they may tend more towards Thomism, for instance. So me, I gravitated towards Molinism, although I'm quite fond of um, uh, Thomas Aquinas and uh, have taken more of a uh, mystery of predestination, which that often gets kind of dogmatized 
in various Protestant groups. And a lot of my early studies focused on the, the differences between Calvin and Arminius. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll take a moment here to uh, add that uh, uh, once again, I'm doing this review because there's about 10 minutes worth of content that I'm showing uh, that was edited out. Uh, I want to be able to expound upon some things. And um, also, since the video in question is uh, over an hour, uh, I do need to allow the content to just flow without a lot of interruption uh, so that this particular video doesn't end up to be uh, three hours itself. So following Wesley in this ended up creating many inroads towards what did I just say give me uh, a second so following Wesley in this ended up <laughs> Wesleyness <laughs> Wesleyanism I, I misspoke that's cute he, he edited it out I'm glad he did creating many inroads towards Catholicism um, uh, some people like to um, uh, take shots at, say, uh, people who, who speak in terms of other paths towards God and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and, and for me, my path that God, you know, used and, and, and permitted uh, allowed me to gain a greater sense of truth going from one degree of truth to another uh, through this process and being able to uh, eventually come into the fullness. Now, one of the, the major catalysts for a lot of my research began when I was a student at Nazarene Bible College. I was a senior and I actually became Catholic while I was still taking classes there which was very fun I have to tell you uh, uh, not only that but uh, I actually worked at the college and while I was in the online department there were slow times or sometimes there were tasks that uh, I needed to do that were um, very simplistic and so I would listen to uh, lectures from uh, uh, Concordia Theological Seminary, which is a Lutheran seminary. Uh, so Lutheran lectures, try to gain a better insight into that. Um, I also um, listened to lectures from Reformed Theological Seminary. Uh, I found a lot of uh, audios, uh, lectures that I could listen to. So while I was a student uh, going through my studies, I was constantly listening to academic lectures on... Uh, uh, Reformed, Lutheran, and uh, uh, Catholic, and so I just absorbed this content, and so that I could uh, reason with it myself, and so and it gave me a lot better insight into when I would write papers and things like that. It was a, a very fun experience. I had a, a supervisor there that was a bit anti-Catholic; would make comments to me and stuff. Uh, but uh, I kind of pushed back on that, and I remember uh, there being um, these uh, these times where I was quite frustrated uh, with the uh, students and professors. Uh, I actually enjoyed talking to the professors a bit more, but I think if I did become frustrated with them, uh, I. I had greater reason to be frustrated with them who actually knew a lot of content, but they didn't know a lot about the things that I was researching. Uh, they may have went through their courses of study and who knows, uh, you know, if you're just in one theological tradition, there are people who they're born and raised in the church of Nazarene, you know, and all they do is read books from Beacon Hill press and, uh, so on and so forth. And, um, it's it's almost all they know and uh, there isn't a lot of uh, comparative analysis between that and other thought uh, beyond what explanations they have 
uh, for the critiques that other people can make and so on and so forth. The same sort of thing that anybody would do. Uh, like as a Catholic, I would do that, you know, try to defend the uh, Catholic uh, faith against um, uh, attacks and objections and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I just remember my experience there. Um, there, there was another Catholic that was there. She was the daughter of a, uh, a guy who helped me become Catholic, who was born uh, Nazarene. He was the, uh, the son of a, uh, a Nazarene pastor. And uh, he went through Nazarene Bible College and Holy Apostles College and Seminary. He took, if I remember, maybe five to eight years to become Catholic, he read through the entire Anton Nicene Fathers, and um, he wrote a book as to like why he became Catholic and stuff. And so, he was more familiar with Wesley and James Arminius than I was, and obviously intimately acquainted with the the early Church Fathers. And I just remember uh, that he was just a huge help to me. Um, being having been grounded even more so in the things that I had to help me uh, be able to understand some of his conclusions um, it was just a perfect fit um, uh, shout out to John for, for all his help in that regard uh, lots of stories of me interacting with the professors during the classes um, but uh, there was, um, like, like for instance, there, there was this occasion where uh, we were in the Book of Acts, and the professor raised the question of whether or not there was any authority passed on after the apostles. And I, and I think he asked the question to, um, uh, to, to merely get us to think about a new question. But I had just read the letters of Ignatius so I raised my hand and I said uh, you know I was just reading today in Ignatius of Antioch who was the disciple of uh, the Apostle John he said uh, yes <laughs> there's apostolic succession uh, there is an authority that is there that uh, persisted and you can see this continuity throughout the early church fathers it was it, it was uh, unanimous um, in antiquity, and um, he uh, said absolutely nothing. Blank stare on his face. He just moved on, and, and just pretended I didn't say anything at all. It was it was absolutely uh, uh, amazing to have that kind of experience. There wasn't any dialogue at all on the point, uh, even though he had raised the question. But there's no way of combating the fact that there's historical continuity on this doctrine from the earliest writings. And even the apostles themselves were establishing successors, you know, with Paul, with Timothy, and so on and so forth. Um, and what the church understood and believed about the preservation of apostolic tradition. And that was an, a, another divergence with Wesley, is that despite the, the Wesleyan quadrilateral that looks at tradition, obviously what it comes down to is that a person who finds something in tradition that disagrees with their personal interpretation of scripture, then they can just discard it. Uh, because scripture is primary uh, and um, but unfortunately objectively that really isn't how it functions the individual basically ends up being the final arbiter of truth and, and interpreting scripture um, and i give people credit they're reading their bibles they're trying to make sense out of it and that's fair um, and people follow um, the, those interpretations which uh, m appeal to them or make the most sense to them where they're at. I, I know I certainly did. Um, with, with good faith, of course, uh, always with um, a kind of tentative attitude and openness to, I could be wrong. I'm always open to 
more. That's what a student does. You know, uh, they are developing their convictions. Um, uh, they are uh, building a rational foundation for um, why they think what they do. Um, so I give people credit for making the effort and doing that, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can look at the early church fathers and uh, use them as our guide to better understand what scripture is. So in the Bread of Life discourse, if we find that, uh, I will jump in here because I mentioned the Bread of Life discourse, but as soon as he mentioned the uh, being born of water and spirit, I shifted to explain that one as well. But uh, with the Bread of Life discourse, it's often said that when Jesus explains that flesh is of no avail, what matters is spirit, you know, um, that they're thinking that therefore Jesus is speaking only metaphorically, but spiritual doesn't mean metaphorical. Um, and in this context, there's that distinction between um, understanding Jesus according to the flesh or according to the spirit. Are we going to understand the deeper spiritual truths that he's trying to convey to us as opposed to the, uh, the, the, the as opposed to the flesh, uh, which uh, an antithesis between the two is established by St. Paul in Romans and Galatians and, and elsewhere, uh, where there's this tension or there's this challenge that exists uh, within the human person in its fallen state. Um, as such, the, uh, d during the Bread of Life discourse, the Pharisees were constantly interpreting uh, in a naturalistic way, how can you give us your uh, flesh and blood to eat? Even with the Nick at Night event with Nicodemus, you know, how can I enter my mother's womb to be born a second time? Uh, you know, this is an understanding according to the flesh. They're not understanding the deeper spiritual explanation, the meaning that Christ is conveying. And so Jesus is obviously not talking about uh, cannibalism in the bread of life discourse. But nor is he speaking strictly metaphorical, you know, where there's just a kind of correlation of meaning that exists, but rather a real deep spiritual meaning that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life in you. So the, the, the early fathers understood this to be referring to the Eucharist. Likewise with the, uh, you must be born of water and spirit has always been understood as baptism. And so, but I use that because it triggered a memory that I had uh, a dialogue with an, uh, somebody at Nazarene Bible College. Uh, or what, what or, or uh, other Catholic sounding verses. We find that uh, in the John early church. Five. Must yeah. be born again. Yes, the, that one of uh, water and spirit. It's, it's, um, you know, I remember I, I, I was in the library, Nazarene Bible College, and I was, I was talking to the, the, the wife of one of the professors who was also a student. And uh, I mentioned to her that it was universally understood that this is talking about baptism in, in this verse. And, um, and she challenged that. And I said, you know, whatever we have to say about exegesis, I, I find it odd, um, or even the hubris of it, that somehow only now do we understand what Paul meant, and nobody else seemed to have understood. You know, it, it's, it's, it's like saying we understand John better than Ignatius, for, for instance. Y you know. Um, right, yeah. 1,600 years it took for us to finally get it. But everybody else still doesn't get it, just me. 
Correct. And um, so I began to see this issue. And, and I knew that just with baptism, not just with baptism, but with the Eucharist, that if I were to follow the consent of the fathers on these particular doctrines, there isn't a single Protestant denomination that holds to those. I you know, what's, what's interesting is uh, one of the books I read very early on was um, Crossing the Tiber by Stephen Ray. And I, I remember that that was two issues that he addressed in his book. And he shared quotations from the early church fathers concerning baptism and the Eucharist and the unanimous consent of the fathers concerning those two doctrines. Now, I, I remember looking at that and seeing, oh, wow, that's exactly what the Catholic Church teaches. And it's unanimous in antiquity. Uh, you can see this consistently uh, throughout uh, the early church fathers. And uh, I thought, well, yeah, I could see that to making me cross the Tiber. Uh, which is the the, the, uh, the the point of his book. Um, but I found time and time again, like even if a Protestant had quoted an early church father, very occasionally uh, would a father of the church be referenced uh, by a Protestant. I remember I was talking to um, a Protestant pastor, the first Nazarene church I ever attended, and I remember that I told him that my New Testament professor at the time, I was working through the Alliance program, uh, taking college credit through the district uh, training centers, which I would put together portfolios of the content to submit to Nazarene Bible College to be evaluated uh, to be considered for college credit to ensure that college level learning had actually taken place. And I remember that this particular professor believed that Lazarus wrote the book of John. All right. Well, anyways, I was talking to the Protestant, uh, to, to, to this uh, pastor, uh, this Nazarene pastor, and he he said, uh, and he started quoting to me from the early church fathers. He quoted to me from Irenaeus that John had written the book of John, that there was evidence in the early church fathers that um, Lazarus did not write it. Okay. Uh, as interesting as it was in his claim to internal evidence, um, or his interpretation of, um, of the document. Uh, I found it interesting that we don't know that John wrote it without an appeal to tradition, and here he was quoting tradition in response to it. And that kind of opened my eyes to not only the need to appeal to the early church fathers, but I also recognize that many times when Protestants attempt to quote the early church fathers, they usually do so out of context. So there, 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 there were times where I looked up a passage by that was being quoted by an early church father, supposedly saying something that is Protestant, I would then read the context, the paragraphs before, paragraphs after, and find that the early church father was saying the complete opposite of what was being proposed by the Protestant. I had this experience over and over and over again. Uh, as such, um, uh, once again, the early church fathers just uh, helped me uh, become Catholic. I would have to go to either Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism in order to be able to be part of the church. Um, so that, that was uh, a very strong eye-opener for me, uh, being able to um, 
in, in a way, fo follow one of the things that Wesley said. He he talked about the early church fathers as great lights, great lights of antiquity, the most authentic commentators on sacred scripture. But when I read them, uh, they they just made me Catholic, and. Um, I, I, I tell people that, uh, you know, most people are coming to scripture with some sort of authority or pre a set of presuppositions, whether it's the Calvinists or the Arminians or the Lutherans, you know, they're following Calvin or Luther or, 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 the, or these others. And they're kind of an interpretive lens uh, by which to understand. Um, and much like how the uh, the Mormons say, if you want to understand Jesus rightly, you need to read the Book of Mormon. Uh, I've even heard Lutheran scholars say that the Book of Concord, uh, which uh, has a lot of Lutheran writings, since, such as the Augsburg Confession, small call to articles, uh, Luther's smaller and larger catechism, and so on and so forth, um, is basically like the the picture on the box of a uh, of of a puzzle, and scripture is like the pieces of the puzzle, and so it's an interpretive lens by which they approach scripture, uh, law, gospel, and so on and so forth, um, and if we're going to do this, we just naturally do. Um, why not just approach scripture through the early church fathers especially when there's um, uh, universality and there's uh, antiquity and consent this is the Vincent the Vincent Vincentian canon uh, st. Vincent of Lorenz speaks um, of following antiquity universality and consent uh, among the church fathers and that given the depth of scripture and all the intricacies and all of the heresies that uh, can develop, we need Catholic tradition in order to preserve and understand traditional understandings of scripture in order to preserve itself from that. Uh, this is a very important point. In fact, I will read to you from the fourth chapter of the Combinatorium. Uh, this is uh, St. Vincent of Lorenz in 434 AD. Um, this is what is referred to as the, Vis the Vincentian Canon. He states, I have continually given the greatest pains and diligence to inquire from the greatest possible number of men outstanding in holiness and in doctrine how I can secure a kind of fixed and, as it were, general and guiding principle for distinguishing the true Catholic faith from the degraded falsehoods of heresy. And the answer that I receive is almost to this effect, that if I wish or indeed if anyone wishes, to detect the deceits of heretics that arise and to avoid their snares and to keep healthy and sound in a healthy faith, we ought, with the Lord's help, to fortify our faith in a twofold manner. Firstly, that is, by the authority of God's law, then by the tradition of the Catholic Church. Here it may be, Someone will ask, since the canon of scripture is complete and it is itself abundantly sufficient, that is materially sufficient, what need is there to join to it the interpretation of the church? The answer is that because of the very depth of scripture, all men do not place one identical interpretation upon it. The statements of the same writer are explained by different men in different ways. So much so that it seems almost imp that it seems almost possible to extract from it as many opinions as there are men. Novatian explains it one way, Sabellius in another, Donatus in another, Arius, Eunamius, uh, Ma Macedonus in another, Photinus, Apollinaris, and Priscillian another, 
Jabinian, uh, Pelagius, and Celestius, and another, and latterly Nestorius, and another. Therefore, because of the intricacies, the intricacies of error, which is so manifold, there is a great need for the laying down of a rule for the exposition of prophets and apostles in accordance with the standard of the interpretation of the Catholic Church. Now, in the Catholic Church itself, we take the greatest care to hold that which has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. That is truly and properly Catholic, as is shown by the very force and meaning of the word, which comprehends everything almost universally. We shall hold to this rule if we follow universality, antiquity, and consent. We shall follow univers universality if we acknowledge that one faith, to be which the whole church throughout the world confesses. Antiquity, if we in no wise depart from those interpretations which it is clear that our ancestors and fathers proclaimed. Consent, if in antiquity itself we keep following the definitions and opinions of, of all, or certainly nearly all, bishops and doctors alike, what then will the Catholic, the Catholic Christian do? If a small part of the church has cut itself off from the communion of the universal faith, the answer is sure. He will prefer the healthiest of the whole body to the morbid and corrupt limb. But what is, but what if some novel contagion try to infect the whole church and not merely a tiny part of it? Then he will take care to cleave to antiquity which cannot now be led astray by any deceit of novelty. What if in antiquity itself two or three men, or it may be a city, or even a whole province, be detected in error? Then he will take the greatest care to prefer the decrees of the ancient general councils, if there are such, to the irresponsible ignorance of a few men. But what if some error arises regarding... which nothing of this sort is to be found. Then he must do his best to compare the opinions of the fathers and inquire their meaning, provided always that, though they belong to diverse times and places, they yet continued in the faith and communion of the one Catholic Church, and let them be teachers approved and outstanding, and whatever he shall find to have been held, approved, and taught, not by one or two only, but by all equally and with one consent, openly, <laughs> frequently, and persistently, let him take this to be held by him without the slightest hesitation. That is the Vincentian Canon found in chapter 4 of the Commandatorium. <laughs> What Saint Vincent Saint Vincent of Lorenz wrote in AD four thirty four. That over there, very good. Um, I suppose the only way that I, I I thought of trying to get out of accepting this really hinges on whether or not the the church could defect. And of course, the, that basically was the whole point of the Reformation, is that they thought that doctrine had become deformed, so it needed to be reshaped um, based on their interpretations of Scripture. Um, but it was ended up being quite the opposite. It ended up simply being a revolt that ended up uh, deforming doctrine and. Uh, they were the ones that defected. Um, so, being exposed to exactly what the Catholic Church teaches was was huge for me because mm -hmm. I had been exposed to a lot of the anti-Catholic traditions, a lot of the you worship Mary, you know, you worship bread. You worship the Pope, 
Peck, you're, you're worshiping everything but Jesus, you know, kind of thing. And Catholics are going to hell. Uh, we, we need to, uh, you know, preach the gospel to them. Um, and so, um, but as I began to read like Lorraine Wetner um, and, and others, oh, I began to realize, well, I mean, I, so there was a book sale at Nazarene Bible College. Uh, sometimes they get rid of some of their older books and they sell them to the students. And another student saw this book that said Roman Catholicism on it and handed it to me because they knew that I was uh, uh, interested in studying Catholicism. At the same book sale, I found uh, Ludwig Ott's Ludwig uh, fundamentals of Catholic dogma, which is by far one of my favorite texts to read and, and study uh, as a theologian. But I, I opened that book up and there were like four errors per page. Quotes weren't referenced. I, I mean, anybody worth their salt and scholarship could recognize that this thing is just... <laughs> not worth reading and i wasn't and yet, even protestants have married themselves to that book and have loved that book and used that book because what they what they want is they want the things in the book to be true it doesn't matter if it is true or not it is true that uh people definitely want a kind of confirmation in what they presently think i do the same thing when i study papal encyclicals and other things i want to understand what the church has to say to me it's uh, adherence to an authority. It's, an, it's a uh, wanting to uh, deepen one's own convictions and what they're presently convicted of. Um, but objectively, historically, just as, I, just as I became a Christian by studying the historicity of Jesus Christ, the reliability of the New Testament documents, applying that same principle to early church history patristics um it reveals that church which scripture talks about that christ established and where else am i supposed to go you know people make these claims that constantine created the catholic church in the fourth century kind of things and it's like you do realize that ignatius the uh uh, disciple of John referred to the Catholic Church and the church has consistently referred to itself as the Catholic Church so if you went someplace and he was a first century bishop yeah, absolutely so, so if you went someplace and there were the Donatists over here like hey where's the Catholic Church you, you know uh, they, they would tell you exactly where you know where, where the, the, the Catholics are meeting and so, uh, and I didn't know a lot about the ecumenical councils or, or anything like that. So um, that seems to be a, a huge point of divergence for some Christians. I do find it interesting that uh, people continue to, well, at least some, think that Constantine started the Catholic Church. Like, what does that even mean? You know, the disciple of John, Ignatius of Antioch, referred to it as the Catholic Church. It uh, continued to teach the things that it taught. Never was it ever said by any of the Christians in the 5th century, hey, by the way, Constantine did all of this stuff. We used to believe this, but now we believe that. You don't find any of that uh, in any of the writings, ever, anywhere. Um, it's fanciful. It, it's, not, it's not real. Uh, so in the fourth century, um, at 325, we have the, sorry, I'll take a step back. In 313, there's the Edict of Milan, where Christianity becomes legalized. You can now legally be a Christian, right? You, you, you're not going to be persecuted for being a, uh, a Christian because now it's legal. It's not illegal anymore. All right. In 325, you have the Council of the First Ecumenical Council in 325. And then we have the Second Ecumenical Council uh, around 
380, 381, and around that exact same time, uh, Christianity actually became, at that time, the official religion of the Roman Empire. And once again, in the 5th century, 6th century, nobody's saying, Constantine changed this. You know, no, they're, what do they say? We've always believed this. We've always believed that. Continually, they are explaining and expounding upon the teachings of the Antinicene fathers. Uh, as such, uh, there is no historical proof. There's a lot of uh, what you could say conspiracy theories of people trying to make these little connections, but um, that's something that's imposed. Those are, that's kind of like an exegesis onto history, uh, an eisegesis onto history, uh, as opposed to looking at the extent texts, look at the history of Christian thought. You're not going to find this supposed Constantine started the Roman Catholic Church. It's just. It's just weird. It had been consistently the Catholic Church, and we have uh, the the history of the writings uh, in their entirety through this process, through this time they claim this took place, and and and, and it just certainly doesn't. Uh, there isn't, as John Wesley referred to, as a uh, a complete corruption of faith and morals during this time. Uh, rather, the church continued to teach the faith and morals during this period. Um, and we need to uh, look at this. We need to adhere to it because this particular uh, uh, claim to conspiracy theory, as many as the, any man could uh, you know, conceive, history is there. It's, pl it's pretty plain and simple. You just adhere to the structure that uh, Christ established, the apostles established, their successors established, and just continue to remain uh, faithful to apostolic uh, succession in its preservation through the role of the Holy Spirit as the soul of the church to preserve uh, the ongoing doctrinal development and and the preservation of that faith that was once and for all given unto the saints, um, the apostolic tradition. Um, because the, uh, the Coptics, you know, or the Caesarean Church of the East, the, the, uh, um, the Oriental Orthodox, you know, they broke off after the, th I think it was the Third Ecumenical Council, or, or, or the Fourth. Um, you know, and in each, in each time, the church preserves orthodoxy. That was the Catholic line. Which is ironic. Because they say they're orthodox, and yet the Catholic church is the one who has preserved orthodoxy completely and entirely. Yeah, I, I think uh, some recent dialogue with them concerning, you know, some of their... There are issues of whether or not you know, Christ is of, uh, you know, in two natures, uh, you know, and this, this language that may have sounded a bit too Nestorian to them, um, you know, uh, may not uh, signed on to the uh, Chalcedonian definition, uh, but, uh, you know, perhaps there may have been, you know, some semantic issues, uh, some misunderstandings, you know, potentially. Uh, I certainly would like to see uh, full communion of all Christians at some point. And the yeah, that's the idea of that, uh, whether or not it's um, two natures in one person or one person of two natures. Sorry, one person in two natures versus one person of two natures. Uh, they thought that the uh, former was or sounded a bit too Nestorian uh, for them, the Catholic Church, because r really, you know, the Catholic Church isn't divided. You know, people look at Christianity in the world and they and they think that, well, therefore, you know, the, the church 
has many branches, you know, or the conception of denominationism. Um, but yeah, the idea of denominationalism is fairly new, and it's a very interesting phenomenon in our time uh, where people are looking at the Catholic Church as just one denomination among others, for instance. And it doesn't really matter. Just go wherever you feel right or you like the preaching or they have a good, uh, you know, youth program or, or something like that. But uh, really, none of this stuff really existed prior to the 16th century with the Protestant revolt, right? Those who protested the mass who uh, and uh, who wanted to reform uh, put a different shape or create a new version of Christianity based on their private interpretations of scripture um, which created all kinds of problems it created as many theologies as there were minds to conceive of them uh, or they threw out the authority of the church. And so the sacraments uh, became watered down. And now you just have this constant uh, uh, fighting among people, arguing for one particular uh, theological tradition versus another. And if one finds themselves in the midst of this, I don't blame you at all for being there because I used to be there I used to be part of the Church of Nazarene I used to be part of the Wesleyan Arminian theological tradition I I, I, I totally get it I'm grateful that God carved a path forward in the midst of this and used uh, my experiences and my studies and, every, and, and the truths that were contained therein uh, to, to draw me to the Logos, right? Who is reaching me, who is, who is drawing me, seeking me, and uh, will uh, bring me forward towards himself in the midst of any and all. Um, uh, as such, you know, being able to look back into history and seeing that Christ had established something, that the apostles had established something, and we can see this continuity of apostolic succession there in the church fathers. Um, it's not. It's definitely something we don't have to be afraid of. Um, uh, it, it encourages us to continue to deepen in our Christian faith, to be drawn to the fullness of uh, what. Christ, God has revealed to us and how it's been expounded upon and, and everything else in the church. Um, the Holy Spirit is really helping us to uh, understand all the intricacies and preserve the church from error and from defects so that um, even if we're not studious, even if we're not intelligent, we have some place that we can go where we don't have to recreate their wheel. We don't have to be intelligent and studious and educated uh, in order to just be able to just go to that church that Christ established and know that you're okay. And you can just rest and you can learn and you can grow and you, 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 you can study uh, at your own pace because you're home, you're here, you're there. So it's just to take that into consideration. God has provided for the simple as well as for the um, intelligent and educated among us. But really the, the, the church is one, it's one holy Catholic apostolic. It's not divided. There's just various groups that have diverged from the true church which Christ had established. Um, and it has to be something somewhere. I mean, even during the apostolic age, you know, the apostles would teach and they would pass on the tradition. 
99.9% of the time, they were passing it on verbally. They were, and they told the churches, this is what you follow. This is what you adhere to. And this was basically put into the churches, like a rich man putting money in a bank, you know, and this is how it's preserved um, uh, in the church. So um, at some point, I just couldn't remain Protestant anymore because I could see that only that the Protestantism does not maintain the model of authority. <laughs> hey, Captain. Yes, it's, it, it looks like I'm interviewing myself. Isn't that funny? Uh, but no, uh, I'm actually um, listening and commenting upon the interview that I gave to uh, Brian Mercer over at Catholic Truth on YouTube and uh, we have another like 16 minutes to look at and I've been trying to stay quiet because there's an hour of content uh, an additional hour uh, sorry an additional 10 to 15 minutes in this unedited um, uh, uh, version that I have that you can't find on Catholic Truth um, but uh, I, I also thought, hey, you know, if I'm going to show that, I might as well comment upon the whole thing. I got additional stories and additional ideas and stuff that I'm sharing. So that is in the pages of the New Testament. In the pages of the New Testament, we see writings that were later um, uh, said to be scripture. That's not to say that they weren't originally inspired in and of themselves. Uh, but th they may not have been originally treated that way. I'm, I'm just making that point. We have... Though it, it makes sense that if the apostles were delegated the teaching authority in the church, that not only their writings were inspired by the Holy Spirit to reveal public revelation uh, to the church and to basically instill this into the churches right to deposit it and as it's a deposit of faith right um but also their public preaching uh, would have carried a similar charism where they weren't actively teaching heresy by mistake and things like that but rather that their teaching authority itself um, carried a kind of charism of infallibility so that as they taught you can be rest assured that you can listen to what the Apostle Paul is saying you can listen to what Peter is saying and it's per perfectly fine they're not going to error in presenting this to you you know so the full interview, uh, I will, yes, I linked it into the Discord. You can see it there. Um, this version, though, uh, there was about 10 minutes that was edited out, so I decided that I was going to listen to this, so there would be some things that you can hear uh, in this video that you're not going to be able to hear in the original video. Um, and like I said, because that's the case there's about 10 15 minutes worth of difference closer to 10 i originally said 10 to 20 but uh i, I it looks like it's about 10 minutes worth of content uh i wanted to expand upon it, expound upon it and share more stories and stuff a living authority in the apostles and their successors uh we have verbal preaching which composed most of what they were passing on and they were to continue to preserve this this idea that everything that the apostles verbally taught is in the the the, the writings that were very fragmentary and occasional uh, what God wanted to have consigned into writing yes um, but there are interpretations and nuances and explanations. It's, uh, just, just imagine, 
you know, Paul going to Ephesus and preaching for three years straight kind of thing. Um, we have one letter from Ephesus. That's nice. Uh, that's, that's amazing. Um, but wouldn't it have been nice to actually sit and listen to Paul for two or three years in Ephesus? Go on and on and on. You know, and he's not just doing the same sermon over and over again. He's He, he didn't just day one write uh, the, the letter to the Ephesians and then read it to them over and over again. You know, he expounded, he preached, he, he gave the apostolic tradition in all its fullness over time in bits and pieces. And this is uh, given to the churches and they were called to continue to preserve this. They did that in the first century, they did it in the second century, they did it in the third century, and bits and pieces of that show up in the early Christian writings and the early church fathers, those interpretations, those teachings. Um, and if we are truly going to have a kind of hermeneutic of continuity, we would have to say that the church in the second century is following the exact same model that we saw in the first century. Otherwise, we, we impose some sort of um, a break in authority. Like everything just drops off and all of a sudden every single, like the Apostle John dies and then all of a sudden, well, I'm only going to follow what's what it says in first and second Thessalonians now I don't care what Paul preached to the churches you know I don't I don't care what church authority has to say this is my interpretation of first and second Thessalonians uh, nobody was doing that they weren't you know taking those things in a vacuum it was communal it was read within the context of the heart of the church within the ecclesial community. They were read, they were expounded, uh, and, and they were taught. And these things continue to be preserved. Protestants will say that, you know, God has the ability to inspire these writings, to use the apostles to, uh, to, to preach new revelations and uh, have authority in the church. Uh, and all of a sudden, where does that Holy Spirit go? Was it chased into a book? No, it continued to, the Holy Spirit continued to be the very soul of the church. Not actively revealing, because at the close of the apostolic age for the de death of John, there's no new public revelation that is given. But the Holy Spirit doesn't disappear. The Holy Spirit now preserves and make sure that the church doesn't defect and has perpetuity and continual authority. It's the Holy Spirit doesn't disappear. Yeah, and I think that's why so many Protestants, when they do study history, they become Catholic because they realize the earliest Christians were Catholic and so many who are sincere go back and say, well, there's so much infighting in Protestantism. It's 50 pastors on one street. How do I as a pastor know that I'm giving the actual gospel to my church. And so they go back to the earliest Christians. They say, well, let's go back to the earliest Christians, the pure, pristine Christians. What did they believe? And then their eyes open. They're like, what? This can't be right. And they go deeper and deeper. And they said, we're all wrong. <laughs> you know, in a sense, they discover the truth of the early church and they discover Catholicism at such an early date. It has to be shocking to people, and I know that it was for me when I started reading the early church fathers, um, because for almost a full decade, the version of Christianity that I followed was Wesleyanism. Uh, I absorbed the, the thought of John Wesley. I spent a lot of time studying his life and thought, his interpretations, his sermons, uh, every, everything else. And so the early church fathers ends up being foreign to me. So in, in all fairness, you know, for somebody who, who really dives deep and goes down all of these theological rabbit holes, but they're never exposed to the early church fathers, are going to find themselves um, at odds 
with the early church fathers. And so uh, they're going to be exposed to new and foreign concepts. And for them, that's kind of scary because it's often drilled into the minds of Protestants that if you don't go by just the Bible, you could end up believing anything. You know, uh, why not be Mormon? Why not be this? Why not be that? There, there needs to be some guiding principle, uh, some measure of authority or theological tradition in which uh, one comes to understand these things. But for a person who, say, has been part of the Church of Nazarene for 50 years, and they start reading quotations from Augustine, whom they've heard their whole life as being this great, uh, great intellectual, you know, scholar in Western Christianity, and they start finding all this Catholic stuff, it can be very scary. I, m I remember Scott Hahn one time said, you know, he was just, he was discovering these, th these, um, th these, these profound uh, ideas or insights into scripture, and then found that the early church fathers were talking about that with a kind of you all know you know kind of attitude you know and it, it, it's very it's it, it's very humbling uh it, it's it's it can be very scary you and know scott Hahn was like a premier presbyterian leader you know and he had read like ten thousand books you know like he to get to the point where this is what the truth is i mean and then he's like i've reinvented the wheel the earliest Christians already believe this. Here, I thought I was like the scholar of scholars, and they already believed it. It's um, it can be very disconcerting to maybe have even spent thirty to forty years with a particular denomination of Protestantism. I'll say it that way. That um, has been the kind of locus or the orienting concern or the uh, the centerpiece of how one has thought and processed and experienced uh, Christianity as a whole and uh, one may propose that well I mean isn't this just sufficient then isn't it okay that as long as that you have Christ well, it really depends on what that even means. I mean, if, you, if you're if you an Apollinarian and you think that the Logos replaces the human soul of Jesus, and then you propose that uh, Jesus on the cross is an innocent man who is punished by the Heavenly Father who's got to get out his rage and wrath, um... Uh, in order that he could forgive us and that uh, you know Jesus is just another consciousness another will another um, intellect uh, within the Trinity well I've just expounded what is according to the Catholic Church three distinct heresies um, and so it just kind of begs the question of whether or not we are really understanding Christ as he is in himself and not just some kind of version of him that has been crafted by somebody at some time, but something that we've actually uh, has been preserved and that has been um, passed on to us by the church, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth which the gates of Hades will not prevail against. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, <clears throat> for me, after being influenced by um, these Catholic influences and re reading a lot of the Antonicene Fathers and uh, um, really finding this, this continuity, um, when it came to like Mary and the intercession of the saints and things like that, for, for, for some reason, a lot of Protestants have a hard time with Mary, uh, but I never really did. Um, a lot of the uh, reasoning behind it, 
uh, the, the doctrines, because if it marries anything because of Christ, they're all Christocentric, you know. She's the mother of God. She's uh, gate of heaven. She's, you know, all, 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 of, all of the things that we can say about Mary. Um, and I guess I personally just didn't have uh, a hard time with those things, but I know some people really do. I have I have a friend who uh, I remember just asking him, "Can we refer to Mary as Blessed?" And he couldn't even. He's like, "No, no, we 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 can't do that," you know. Or like, "Can we at least honor her for the role that she played in salvation history?" And he's like, "No, no, we 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 we, we can't do that," you know. And uh, like like. And for me, the, the uh, uh, I guess the the kind of cognitive dissonance that that, that exists in a kind of anti-Catholic attitude that that makes it difficult for people to recognize uh, some of the, the the Marian doctrines. So when I read in Irenaeus that you know um, Mary untied the knot by her obedience that Eve had tied you know that early connection that that Mary played a role in salvation history in such a profound way because at the prompting of a fallen angel Eve takes of the tree and eats whereas with Mary she at the prompting or at the annunciation of a good angel gives her consent and obedience so that the fruit of her womb can be put back onto a tree it, it, it is it's just so profound and um that it's it's so for me it's so difficult not to see anymore like i can't unsee it like once you read the fathers you can't unsee it um when you start to see some of the uh the problems with uh protestantism you, you just you just can't unsee it and you, and, and you can't go back um how long have you been catholic for now uh let's see uh, maybe about 15 years okay wow so you're you're in it yes yeah, um, I, but I, I remember um, when I was a student at Nazareth Bible College in my uh, late 20s, I, I started listening to Catholic Answers and S Scott Hahn and um, all, all these others just explaining what Catholic doctrine was. Uh, I was fortunate in that I didn't have a lot of anti-Catholic traditions, fake caricatures, that I had to change. Just a second. I'm going to take this back about 30 seconds in order to address the fact that there was some droppage. And it looks like it may have dropped again. Okay, then it reconnected, waiting for OBS to connect here. One of the problems of doing it uh, live, but it's much easier to just it still says disconnected. Well, I got four minutes. I think we're good. Uh, we'll see here. All right, very good. We are reconnected again. So. Let's see if we can get this to uh, start going. Dropped again. Well, at least the uh, recording is fine, but yeah. See if we can get this uh, going. 
going again and that I'm doing this because I'm not Catholic and that wasn't my identity as it seems to be the identity of some <laughs> to, to simply not be Catholic to be anything else um, so as I was, I was absorbing those things I got to see what Catholicism was mm -hmm. um, on its own I didn't have to correct caricatures that existed merely in the minds of men basically and uh, I actually found that to be very intriguing that there does exist these caricatures that exist in the minds of men and they teach as if they're an authority on what Catholicism is as opposed to just listening to the magisterium um, they may even have d difficulty interpreting things that take place and Catholic teaching because they're viewing it through the lens of their fundamentalist uh, literalist reading of things they do that to scripture they're gonna do that to the documents of the church as well amen and uh, do you have any parting thoughts quickly briefly for anyone of our listeners any last thoughts yes um, I would recommend to people to <clears throat> be tentative in your theological uh, studies uh, leading to uh, the, the fullness of truth, having that openness um, and having and not being scared to become Catholic. You know, uh, I know what it's like uh, to lose friends, to um, be isolated. Um, but you don't have to invent the wheel anymore. You can just come home. You can rest. Um, you can continue to study, but you're not creating anymore. You're, you're, you're just resting and discovering and uh, um, being a lot more at peace theologically. And um, so that would be my encouragement to people is just continue to hit the books, continue to learn what it is and why it is and study history and uh... and where can people find you if they want to follow your work alright that gets us to the end um, I'll probably just maybe upload the version that I have recorded locally and uh, that way there isn't going to be any kind of weird uh, um uh, output with uh, OBS uh, live and so on and so forth so I hope you enjoyed my reflection on this um, obviously you know if you want to make comments or share your thoughts or ideas or anything like that I'm certainly uh, willing to uh, engage in conversation and uh, hear your stories as well so uh, God bless everybody and you have a wonderful day